Kate. Welcome to Professional Book Girl. This is a very big moment for the show because I think all of my listeners know you are one of my very favorite authors. I have a favorite shelf behind me and two of your books sit on it and the Briar Club will be joining them once I get my hands on a physical copy, which is really the highest honor. So it is I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Can you give everybody the elevator pitch for your latest novel, The Briar Club? Uh, in a nutshell, this is a book about a group of very different women who really have nothing in common except the fact that they are all boarders at Briarwood House, which is an all-female boarding house on the shabby genteel side of Washington, D.C. in the early part of the 1950s. And these women slowly, as they get come to know each other through the weekly supper club of their newest arrival, who has just arrived in the attic room, they realize that they have a lot to offer each other, a lot of friendship that can enrich each other's lives. But they also realize that they all have secrets and that some of those secrets are deadly. How did you come up with the idea for this book? Well, this book actually came about because I really think of it as being what I think of as my post-pandemic book. I think most writers have a pre-pandemic, have a pandemic book, which is, you know, whatever we think of as, you know, the, the book we poured all of our anxiety and dark feelings about lockdown and the pandemic into that one. And I certainly have one of those. But this really came about because it was the book I wrote right as, you know, the world was just tentatively starting to open up again. Um, I happened to read a wonderful uh essay by Lori Colwyn, who's a great food writer of the past, who wrote with a great deal of humor and heart about her years as this broke 20-something living in a broom closet-sized apartment in New York and managing to feed her equally broke friends from a kitchenette that really was nothing more than a mini fridge and a hot plate and a dish rack that was parked in the bathroom. And I reread that essay a lot during lockdown, just whimpering, because I would have happily cooked on a hot plate and drain spaghetti in my bathtub if I could just be surrounded by loved ones and scraped plates and friends and half 50 bottles of wine. So this is a book that really came about because in part because I really missed my friends and I wanted to write a book about connection and about people coming together around a table because I missed that in my own life. And so it really started there with the idea of a stranger who comes to town and starts to pull her neighbors together around her table and what comes out of that. <laughs> So I live in New York and I've been in this apartment for five years, but in, I'm in the bigger bedroom now, but I started in what I call the Harry Potter room. Like it was literally a closet and reading about Grace's attic room reminded me of living in that room. Although I do think hers might be a little bigger than what I was dealing with in that bedroom. It, but it, I, Grace really loves the room and she puts, she starts painting the walls and you can tell like she's, she's very happy in this little space. And I felt that come through the page so clearly and it reminded me of how happy I once was in that little room when I would have friends over, there were times where I would cram them into that small room. It was just, I, it was such a connection to the book that I wasn't expecting. Um, and I think that exact mission came through so clearly to the reader. actually had a inspiration for this book in I found the perfect room that I thought of as Grace's room. It is the Belfry room of the Sleeper McCann house in uh, outside of Boston. And it is this fabulous room, if you Google it, that is all slanted ceilings. And, you know, like, a, 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 you know, like the bed is right, right under a place where you bonk your head in the morning, I'm sure. But it's got these green walls and this wonderful sunlight. And there are flowers and vines painted all over it. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, that is Grace's room. And it is a little bit about, as you say, it's like, you know, the ability for even a very small and potentially uncomfortable space to really be transformed by, you know, someone's love and the way, what they put into it and the friends that they bring to it. And it really it comes down to, you know, what makes a house a house versus a house a home. And why does why and how does Briarwood become a home to the women who live there? And Grace, first and foremost, among them, and not just Alice. I love that. I'm going to have to Google the room now because I I have I had an idea in my head. Um, so the way that this book is structured, I re I'm a short chapter person, but this is not short chapters. But I really loved it. It was like each woman got their own 
part of the book and you would get to spend a decent amount of time with with each porter in the house how did you decide to write it that way it came about because i knew i wanted a big cast of characters for this book i wanted to dive into each woman who lived there and it was a format I was familiar with because I'm a big fan of Maeve Binchy. And that is a format that she uses in some of my favorite books of hers, like uh, Evening Class is one. And she'll take a big cast of characters who share something together, some experience, and then she will rotate the points of view. So that way you get to spend time with each one. And that way, even as you're reading about one character, you're already curious about, well, I'm really liking this one, but what about Claire who lives on the third floor? We haven't heard about her yet. What's her deal? You know, you want to know. And that's something I thought would work well for this book because it, you know, begins and it you know, begins when, you know, the newest boarding, mem boarding house member comes in, takes that attic room. And she is the one you get almost the very last because she's the most mysterious of the uh, boarding house guests. And she's the one with the biggest secret. And you get to hear everybody else's story before you hear hers and you hear how she has affected all of their lives in turn and then you finally get hers. And I rigged it that way because I thought that would you know, do the best, be the best way of letting the reader get to know each character in turn and know them well and yet still be stoking curiosity about, you know, what is the big secret for the woman who lives in the Greenwald attic room? Um, you did it so well because I, I felt like I lived in the house with them. I felt like I knew these women like the back of my hand because you would see them through other people's perspectives. And then like when we would finally meet someone like Arlene, then you're in her head seeing it from such a totally different angle. Like I, I loved it so much. I felt like they were my friends. Like it, it I, yeah, it was just so good. So what was it like to write about like Grace, for example, who is the m m most mysterious character um, from how did you decide how to like sprinkle little bits of her personality and her life through different perspectives? Well, it was the idea that, you know, no one ever truly knows what's going on in someone else's life. And I wanted to show that each one of these women, she's one thing on the surface and then she's also going to be something else underneath once you finally get into their head. I mean, some of these women are very good at projecting on the surface something that's very different on the inside. And, you know, I think that's very universal today as well. You know, everybody tries to put up a good front of, you know, what it is that we're trying to, you know, present to the world is different from what we're actually feeling and to some degree, especially with social media where we want to, you know, present what's good about our lives, but we don't want to, you know, necessarily show the bad part of things. So I wanted each woman to have a little bit of that going on. And so you get to know them when, through the eyes of their housemates, but then you're also going to get to know them in, you know, internally and very well once you get into their heads. And I really wanted to use each woman as a little bit of a lens to examine a different part of life in the 50s. Um, you know, it, so I really structured each one of these women's characters around the idea of like, okay, what can I examine through her eyes? What, what experience will be especially useful seen through her eyes? So, you know, for example, uh, one of the women is a military wife. Her husband is fighting in the Korean War. So that's where I can get in information about the Korean War and about military families. But it's also where I can examine, because she is a nurse, the fact that uh, the birth control pill is just starting to be developed at this time. And that has huge impact for women who are maybe not wanting to be part of the baby boom of the 50s. And there's another woman there who is a refugee from Europe, you know, from managing to come to America in the late 30s. And what does the immigrant experience look like now that we're in the 50s? You know, was how did the American dream, you know, turn out for her? And how is her life unfolding when it's still very much blighted by World War II, even though everyone else is sort of facing forward and not wanting to look back at the war? You know, I have another woman who works for Senator Margaret Chase Smith on Capitol Hill, and she was the perfect lens to examine the political side of things because uh, her boss is the only senator historically who had the guts to stand up there on the Senate floor and tell everyone, you know, that McCarthy was wrong, that what he was doing was un-American, that it was absolutely unconstitutional, and that, you know, frankly, we needed to do better than to listen to him. And everyone said, you know, if a, if a man had given that speech, he would have been the next president. And she was the only one who did it. And so 
McCarthyism, the Red Scare, those are things I could examine through the eyes of, you know, my young woman at Briar, Briar Woodhouse, who works for the senator. And so each one of these women is not only, you know, herself, she's also a way that I tried to examine a different part of life in the 50s, because the 50s is a really interesting time. You know, it's seen as, you know, these this sort of peaceful or boring or, you know, repressive, depending on your point of view, decade in between you know, the, the action-packed World War II dominated 40s and the, you know, even more action-packed uh, civil rights era of the 60s. But, you know, there's a lot going on under the surface in the 50s. And that's really what I wanted to tap into through the eyes of all my various women. That was my favorite thing about this book. Because going into it, I was like, oh, it'll be McCarthyism, Red Scare, which already I was so excited to read that. But it really reminded me that so much history is happening at all time. Because beyond what you just mentioned, there's baseball and the Women's Baseball League. And I grew up loving a league of their own. And then we see JFK get engaged to Jackie. And it was all these little things. There, I was like, yeah, like that this was all happening at the same time. And I, it's, I can't even think of another historical fiction novel that tackled as many historical events. I, I just, I loved it so much. And so I wanted to ask, how did you decide which things to include? Because you covered so much. It was very, uh, a lot of very naughty work with the plotting timeline, honestly, because I had to pick my time spread and it, the book ends up covering about four years. And then I had to pick, okay, what are the crucial events during those four years that I would like to cover? And it really was everything from this, both the start and the finish of the Korean War to, you know, the election of Eisenhower, the end of the Women's World War II Baseball Leagues, the first trials of the birth control pill, um, the, you know, rise of, of McCarthy and the Red Scare, and within that also the Lavender Scare, um, all of, you know, JFK proposing to Jackie, you know, the little things like I Love Lucy starts to show, uh, it starts to show on TV. All of these things are just small stuff that I wanted to get in. And at that point, once I had, you know, my big list of things that I was hoping I could include, it then became about, okay, who is the best set of eyes for each of these events? And then who's, who gets what slot of time? So, which will fit the most organically around those events. So it was a lot of puzzle piecing when I was putting this book together. And I did have to get it have to outline pretty uh, rigorously beforehand to make sure that I could puzzle piece it together just right. How is writing this one in that format different from your other novels? It did make it a little easier in the sense that I had, I had, it was a little more piecemeal, you know, because it was written sort of in parts that meant that I could tackle each smaller part as its own individual arc, which did make it a bit, e bit easier. And I, this book was also a little bit um, stymied by the fact that I had to abandon it in the middle. I had completed um, three out of my like eight or nine overall, you know, portions of the book or chapters. And that's when I got the news that um, the last book that I did, which was I co-authored a novel called The Phoenix Crown with my lovely friend and co-author Janie Chang, um, they wanted that book first, and that was going to have to come out on a tight deadline. So I literally had to abandon the Briar Club about 40,000 words in, and then I had to write my my half of the Phoenix Crown and turn that in, and then I went back to the Briar Club and finished it. So it's the only book I've ever sort of abandoned midstream for another book, but I think that was a little bit easier because than, than it might otherwise have been because I had already finished uh, the third of the eight or nine sections. And then once I was done with that, everything else, uh, it, it meant I could more easily abandon it and then come back to it to a fresh point of view. That's so interesting. And I, I also read and loved The Phoenix Crown. I actually read it right before New York got hit with our random earthquake. And I was like, this is weird universe timing that I maybe didn't need in my head <laughs> experiencing my first earthquake. <laughs> So one of the perspectives in this book is the house itself. And I loved this so much, I think, because I have such a sentimental connection to the house that I grew up in that my family no longer lives in. And I I just loved reading about the house. So the house would have a little chapter before each section would start. And the house is also narrating this great mystery that has happened that we find out in the beginning of the book. But they talk about, you know, Grace's painting and bringing warmth and laughter back in. What was it like writing from the perspective of a house 
And why did you choose to include that? Well, that actually came about at the really the tail end of the editing process. Um, originally, you know, when I sort of put the book together, I have these, you know, the individual sections from each point of view of one of the women in the Briar Club and, in the, uh, and who lives in Bri Briarwood House. And then the glue in between those sections was these little snippets, which start off with on page one with the fact that we know that a uh, body has been found, but you don't know in Briarwood House on Thanksgiving of 1954. But you don't know who the body is, and you don't know who the murderer is who was responsible for the body being there. <clears throat> and so every time you dip back in between chapters to the murder, it is a reminder of, okay, we are working our way forward toward this incredible, you know, moment of violence is, that is waiting for them all in Thanksgiving 1954. And originally when I wrote that, I had a detective uh, as a point of view, you know, just the detective who was, who was in charge of, you know, questioning everybody and is trying to figure out what happened. But the thing is, is that I realized I'm not really interested in police procedural stuff. At least that is, I'm not interested in writing it. <laughs> I do like reading it, but it was more research really than I wanted to do. And I wasn't really interested in the detective as a character. And so I was trying to think of what could be the point of view there, if not a policeman. And then, you know, there's that old saying, you know, if these walls could talk. And I thought, well, maybe they can. Maybe the house, maybe the house can talk. You know, maybe it's the house itself that is aware. And I ran that by, you know, some like critique partners and just said, is this a really stupid idea? And it's like, no, it's artsy. I bet you could, I bet you could do it. Give it a try. And so I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. And I decided to give the house, you know, a, a um, you know, the point of view. So the house, now it's the house that's commentating on the murder that happened within its walls. And the house is very much invested in uh, whether any of its residents go to jail. And that ended up being really quite perfect because a big thing thematically for this book is that it's all about what is it that makes a house a home? Because when the book starts out, it's just a house, you know, nobody feels particularly at home there. Nobody particularly likes living there. And by the end, the house is very much a home and it has become a home because you have someone who pulled the other people together, who made the people inside feel more like a family. And that starts with friendship and it starts with making dinner for people and helping people out. These are the things that help make a house into something more than, you know, just four walls and a roof. And I think most of us have felt like that, that we've lived in places, you know, like your childhood home, that feel like they're more than just four walls and a roof, you know, places that feel special. And so it really ended up being the perfect idea to carry the theme through is the idea that the house itself and not just the uh, residents are a little bit brought to life by the Briar Club once it really gets going and once it really starts to uh, make impact in each other's lives. I loved it so much and it felt like there was almost a magic element to it. So we know that a body has been found and it's a stressful situation and the house will like send like a comforting breeze over somebody. And it was just like, I, I, I've never read about a house and I've read about haunted houses, but I've never read about like such a warm, cozy house. And it's, I think that's kind of what aided into my feeling of like, oh, I feel like I live here. Like my apartment actually is 4B. I was like, I'm in 4B also. Um, one of the other perspectives we get in the beginning of the book is Pete, who is the, there are two children who grew up in the house. I loved him and I loved reading about how these women really took the kids under their wings and like really gave them a sense of family because spoiler, their mom kind of sucks. Um, and then in the author's note, the way that you wrote about children in the fifties, can you elaborate on this? Because it felt like a full circle moment when I read the author's note and I was like, it was like a light bulb. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense why you included that. It's the idea that you know, we have this sort of romanticized notion of family life in the 1950s, you know, like that there's no better time to be a kid, at least, you know, if you're a white middle class kid in America, because, you know, it's supposed to be the era of, you know, white picket fences and three home cooked meals a day and mom who makes cookies after school and, you know, sandlot ball games and, you know, listening to the radio and watching Gary Cooper on TV and, you know, all these things are very idealized. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's there's life is not always perfect, you know, so you have I really wanted to have a couple of kids in the house who really benefit the most from the fact that someone 
needs to care for them because their mother, as you said, their mom sucks. She's terrible. And uh, she's the landlady. She's really more interested in, you know, making money than she really is in looking after her kids. And she has two great kids. And I really wanted one of them to be a point of view in this house. And I thought it would be fun to have a teenage boy when we meet Pete, he's only about 13. And, you know, he's sort of over romantic and he, he's dramatic and he sort of has a rich fantasy life in his head. And yet, and yet he's you know growing up in this house full of women and he really kind of realizes a lot he's going to learn a lot about women from that in a good way and it is the kind of thing where having him meant that I could really kind of give the intro into the house and its world and the people who live there and I really liked the idea of you know showing that you know you he and his sister do not have a particularly good home life regardless of how ideal it's supposed to be to be a kid in the 50s and one of the first things that Grace, as the new arrival, uh, observes is that she observes that his home life is not particularly good. And, you know, she can't make his mom be a better mom, but she can help get him, give and give him a little bit more support and friendship so that he and his sister are not quite so alone in this house where they're supposed to be enjoying their childhoods. And so that's really one of the elements of, you know, found family, because found family is a big thing that I think is probably in all of my books, you know, it's unlikely people coming together and making a family unit that is not standard, but works. And that's what the Briar Club really becomes for Pete and his little sister, because they don't have a very good family, but they do find one inside the borders in this house who come to support them in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. It, it made me think about how my grandparents grew up because they, my grandma was born in 44. So I was like, oh, like that's, that's so how I should be imagining her. And my grandma's name was also Arlene and there's a character Arlene in the book. So I was like, this is a weird like signs from the afterlife as from them as I was reading it. But it just, it really did give me a different, cause I would think about, I used to be like, oh, I want to live in the fifties when I was a kid. Um, I think I was watching Greece too much, but it gave me like such a, great like real perspective on it speaking about found family these the women that live in the house before grace arrives they really don't interact a lot of them don't like each other but grace introduces the supper club can you talk to us about the supper club and how that idea came to you and what it was like to write it i liked the idea that you know bringing people around a table is one of the ways that you can get people to get to know each other. And, you know, I was really missing uh, from lockdown, you know, since I had this idea in like mid 2021, you know, I hadn't seen my friends in a long time. I not had a dinner party in quite some time. And I miss, I miss that whole sensation of people being around a table and gathering to feed them. And so that was one of the ideas I had right from the beginning that um, I would have each per I would have, you know, a supper club and that's how these people would slowly come to know each other. And it also gave me a chance to you know, bring in the foodie angle, which I love, you know, because I've always felt that books and food go together and they should. So I had from the, I, from the beginning also the idea that I would like to include recipes in this book, because if it's, if this is supposed to be sort of a microcosm of life in America, well, food is a huge part of that. What are people eating? And each of these characters, has you know a recipe that they bring you know since they all take turns cooking and i thought it would be a good way to also illustrate how much of a melting pot america is you know is that that you have you know i nora who's irish american who has sort of an classic irish american dish that she brings you have reka who is hungarian and lived in berlin before the war but is you know so brings you know a hungarian dish you've got pete who and his family who are swedish descent so, you know, they bring sweet, he does Swedish meatballs and you've got some all American stuff like fried chicken in there, certainly, but you also have, you know, things that, you know, their, the drummer from next door brings gumbo because he's from Louisiana. You know, you have, uh, B who is the ex baseball player from the women's leagues, uh, yay league of their own. Um, she's from Boston, but from the North end specifically, which is Italian. So, you know, she brings ragu. So I thought the recipes would be a good way to sort of like introduce the idea of like that everybody has a different heritage even if you know they're all calling themselves you know americans and how much of a melting pot we really are from that and then you know everybody learns a little bit more about each other depending on what they make so the supper club you know is really a way that you know, it was a way for all of my people to get together and it was a way that they could slowly start to get acquainted when they were naturally at first you know um all that inclined to be friendly <laughs> 
I found myself looking forward to the supper club scenes in each part. And part of it was to see what each woman would bring. And you didn't mention this, but Arlene brings, I think it's like a banana salad, which I had actually read about. Like, I think I've seen a TikTok of that salad, but that scene, I was, I was like laughing along with the women. Can you um, share what that is maybe? And how did you find that ridiculous recipe? Even as I was thinking about, you know, let's talk about some of the, some bring some great food into this book and um, all the recipes, by the way, with just a couple of exceptions were test cooked and test driven by my husband, who is a fantastic cook and has made everything in this. Um, but there was also the fact that the fifties was also a time where there was some very weird food happening and <laughs> like, you know, like what was their thing was spending everything that they could think of in jello, like nothing should be like there's some things that you really should not be suspended in your pillow and there's casseroles that just like as grace says like that's not a casserole that is a war crime throw that away and it is there's some terrible food that came out of the 50s and there is a great guy on tiktok who does cook vintage recipes with a lot of hilarious commentary and i can't remember if i think i had already read about candle salad which was the salad that arlene brings at one point and it's supposed to look like a candle and um, all i can say is google it and you will not be able to stop <laughs> laughing because it does not look like a candle it is a lettuce leaf on a plate and a pineapple ring you know with a little hole in it and then you cut a banana in half and you put the banana stick the banana in the pineapple ring standing straight up from the plate and you put a cherry on top with a little bit of whipped cream and um all i can say is that it does not look like a candle <laughs> and i don't know anybody eats this with a straight face because it is really something. And so please do for uh, people who are listening, Google candle salad and be prepared to laugh a lot. As I was reading it, I was like, I can't believe that people actually just, like, I was like, how did this actually happen? And it's so funny because after I read this book, that guy started coming up on my TikTok. So somehow from my Kindle to my TikTok app, <laughs> the universe knew I was reading it. And I've been watching his videos making these crazy vintage recipes since I finished the book. The setting of this book is, I think, really important to the story. So we're in Washington, D.C., and I really loved reading about, you know, like the politics of the time, but also a lot of these women are working in government. My Nora was one of my favorite characters and she worked in the National Archives and I loved reading about the Declaration of Independence coming in and the Constitution coming into the building and I was like oh I've like I've been there I've seen that we also have Arlene works for um in the House on American Committee like you mentioned uh, I think it was Claire works for the senator who finally stood up to McCarthy what was it writing about what was it like to write about D.C. at this time um, and choosing where they were? I think specifically like Nora at the archives, because I, I really loved that one. I really thought it would be a good setting because I knew since this was going to be a book that dealt with the Red Scare, I thought to have something at the home of government would be a good idea. I know Washington, D.C. at least decently well because I used to live in Maryland, not very far from D.C. And I thought that it would be a great setting too for specifically a book about a woman's boarding house because there were these women's boarding houses at the time. And DC was a real hub for young professional women because World War II specifically um, did a real recruiting drive, uh, recruiting young women to do these sort of white collar jo office jobs. So you had women who were, you know, coming to DC in droves during the war and then they stayed and then they were coming after the war because there was the there were these well-paid office jobs that were available to them, you know, because so many of the men were going to fight. And so it really did help create the idea of this was the like where the idea of like the young single career girl in America came from. You know, a lot of it was like from this World War II and post-World War II drive to get young women into these relatively well-paid government jobs. And so you would have these all-female boarding houses you know, where women would stay and they could get better pay in DC doing the jobs like this than they could otherwise. So I was looking for that kind of thing. You know, so I have one woman who's working for HUAP, the 
House of Un-American Activities Committee. And, you know, that's terrifying. And then I, you know, I have one woman who's a typist and filer for, you know, uh, Senator Margaret Chase Smith on Capitol Hill. So that was a chance to look into the exactly what kind of, what does the work there look like? And then I can't remember how I found the idea of the National Archives. Oh, no, I do. It was the fact that Nora's story, uh, she's a upwardly mobile, sort of self-educated Irish-American girl from a cop family. You know, her family is mostly police and police officers. She wants to move away from all of that. She does not really approve of her family, a lot of whom are crooked cops. And so she ends up working at the National Archive. And I gave her that job because there was a really young woman I based her on who was a, you know, sort of from an Irish-American foggy bottom family that's, you know, sort of the one area of D.C. where the house is. And she ended up entangled with a guy who was in, in organized crime in Washington, D.C. And she literally was stuck between a rock and a hard place where she was asked, either you give up this inappropriate relationship or you're going to be, you're going to lose your job. And it was a really prestigious job being, you know, a, you know, a high school graduate who's, you know, one of the high end, high level secretaries at the National Archives and doing a lot of important work. So it was a real bind for that particular woman. And I wanted to yeah, reflect that. So I borrowed that particular thing and I learned all kinds of great stuff about the National Archives in the process. And that meant, too, that, you know, since the archives, you know, is the place where so many of the founding documents for this country are housed, it invited a lot of introspection about what is the country supposed to be based on? What is American government supposed to mean? And that's important because, you know, right now, it, during this point, it was McCarthyism was sweeping the country. And frankly, everything that McCarthy was, you know, stirring up witch hunts about, it was a very un-American thing to be doing because he was destroying people's lives on the basis of their beliefs, which is something that is absolutely unconstitutional. And yet it was gripping the country at this point. So it was a good way to introduce some of these ideas of, you know, this is what we're founded on, but what happens when we stray from that? It was, you. it also had me thinking about like our current times and my brain, I feel like I just like exploded after. And also your author's note, which everybody listening always read the author's note, but actually for this one, you said, don't read it first because it does contain spoilers, but you mentioned that so much in the author's note, but that bit about Nora being based off of a real person. I was like, oh, I like, it's like truth is always stranger than fiction. And I just love how you're able to take this like small thing in history and turn it, spin it out into this great story. Um, Nora's relationship and love story was also one of my favorite parts of the book as well. So it was cool that that was kind of based off of something real. Uh, I, I also loved Grace, but I think it might be clear that Nora was my favorite. I'm curious, though, did you have a favorite character to write? I really enjoyed writing all of them, you know, for various different reasons, because they were so different. And it was fun getting to know all of their voices so intimately. Um, I particularly enjoyed writing B, I have to say. B is the ex-baseball player for the um, women's leagues that, you know, sprang up during World War II, you know, with the women's leagues, which were only just coming to an end in the 1950s. And, you know, like you and like so many of us, you know, I watched A League of Their Own growing up and I watched the reboot of the TV series that came out, which I adored <clears throat> and about which is also called A League of Their Own. And it was really fascinating to, you know, delve into that world. But at the same time, neither the book nor the series covered the end of the leagues. They were all about the war years. And I really thought, what would it be like for these women who had this brief moment in time to uh, to have this career? And yet it was only for that brief moment. And what happens when then, you know, you're asked to hang up your cleats because, you know, go back to the kitchen. And it, I really wanted to dive into that a little bit. What does that look like for someone who's on the other side of that? And plus the fact I'm a huge baseball fan, a big Red Sox fan like B. So baseball is a language I, I know how to speak. So it was a lot <laughs> of fun to be able to write from B's point of view. Even though um, I am not an athlete of any caliber like her, but it was still fun to sort of like step into those shoes, as it were, and be able to, you know, write from the point of view of, you know, a really high caliber athlete who is fate forced with the idea of what do you do when you have to, when you are being forcibly retired. I love that because I never thought about what happened after a league of our own ends. Like you, you hear about these things, but sometimes you don't always follow up. And so it was like, I was like, Oh, right. Like 
I was so excited when I read the back of the book and I saw there's going to be a baseball player. Um, and it was just like picking back up something, a, a story like a leave the run that I already was familiar with, but through a new lens. And then I'm not really a sporty girl, but following B and her base and her baseball journey and getting all the girls to play baseball. Like I really love that, like that sense of community. Again, it, I was like, I want to join in. It seemed like it was so much fun. Research for this book, it really was very very broad because i had to go into so much i mean i had books about you know the how the birth control pill was developed i had books about organized crime in washington dc i had books uh, and cookbooks from the time period a book on the pillsbury bake-off which becomes a you know big theme i had books on um, art theft and uh the uh uh, the Nazis' theft of uh, art throughout Europe when they were looting and burning picture, burning paintings as well as books. Um, I had books on everything. I, for anybody who does want to look at, you know, sort of like the broad scale of what the 50s are like, David Halberstrom has a really great book just simply called The 50s. And it takes a really great look from 1950 all the way through 59 at what is happening in the decade as a whole and it's not just the politics it's the politics it's the lead up it is what's happening in entertainment in the movies in uh in the newspapers uh the, you know everything from you know the I, the rosenberg trials to the red scare you know it, he covers so much there and that really gave me a lot for a lot of interesting stuff i read a huge amount of that book when i got stuck on jury duty <laughs> At one point in San Diego, oh my God. I literally was just stuck in a room all day reading and underlining, waiting for my number to be called, which it never was. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything from your research that you wanted to include but had to leave out? Uh, yeah, I would have loved, liked to include something about the Kinsey Report because that came out in the 50s and it was a real bombshell. You know, the Kinsey Report was the report from, you know, this very strange but very thorough scientist where he did the report uh where kinsey did the report it was about human sexuality and it was basically the bombshell that dropped because he interviewed you know thousands of people and the bombshell that dropped with his research was basically that um sex happened and it wasn't out uh, there people are having it and they aren't just having it inside marriage and there is such a thing as premarital sex and there is such a thing as um, sex that is happening not just between a man and a woman, but between women and women and between men and men. And he put all of this together and it was this huge, you know, bombshell that dropped. And it was like people were shocked. They said, you know, you're, you're destroying American morals. And he just said, I'm just reporting on what's already happening. And I would have liked to get something about that in there because there's, you know, it's an interesting watershed moment in the 50s that that came out. But I just didn't have room for it, and I couldn't figure out where, in which of the stories it would go, in which woman's life it would fit. So that's one thing that did not uh, get into the book, although I would have liked to, just because it's a it's a very interesting and you know fantastic little bit of scientific history. <clears throat> Something you do in your books that I love, you place these little Easter eggs and there's an Easter egg in this one to the Rose Code. And I just had to mention this that could be as I'm speaking with you. Um, I literally planned a trip to the UK, like around going to Bletchley Park so I can visit the museum. And I felt like I was in the Rose Code, which is just a testament to how well written that book was. I was like, oh, this is the machine that they were working on. And it was just, I love the little Easter eggs. Um, how do you decide how to do the Easter eggs? And also for anyone listening, if you're in England, go to Bletchley Park because it is so well done there. I, I, I second that. Go to Bletchley Park. It is an amazing step back in time kind of uh, day trip to do so. But yeah, I love doing little Easter eggs to my other books and little connections because in my mind, they all take place in the same world. That actually isn't even just the only Easter egg that I have in this book. There's another one in there as well. And it is a little bit of a thing in, as far as, you know, the, the Rose Code one, because originally I didn't have, I had a character, I have a character in there who's British. She is a young uh, English woman who's married to an American doctor. He's the one who's overseas in Korea and she's sort of left behind with their baby kind of holding down the fort. And she wasn't an English woman to start with, but then I, I was thinking I would like to, you know, open the world up a little bit and why not make her English? And I realized that I could do that. And then as soon as she was English, I thought, well, can I relate her to one of my others? And then I realized with a little bit of jigsawing, I could relate her to a, 
uh, by blood to one of my other characters and heroines in the Rose Code. So I did that. And that gave me a little bit of like a, a little bit of uh, a grounding for her, a little bit of background. And it was just kind of fun to have that connection too. So there is one Easter egg for in the Rose uh, that attaches the Briar Club to the Rose Code. And there is also another one that attaches if you, although it's a little bit more blink and you'll miss it, but you will see there's a tiny, uh, there is a tiny connection of an Easter egg that connects the Briar Club to the Diamond Eye as well. Okay, now I know what you're talking about, because when I read that one, it I was like, is this? But then the Rose Code one seemed so much more obvious. I was like, okay, maybe this is the big Easter egg, but I'm going to have to go back through the book now um, and confirm that I had the first Easter egg right. So what do you hope readers take away from this book? I think if there's anything that I hope that they do take away, that it would be that... <laughs> That, that I hope that readers will, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think about how to put this into words in the right way. I hope that readers will find a story that they love full of women they admire. And I hope that they have maybe some food for thought about what it means to be American and how we can be proud of our homeland, but temper that with the knowledge of where we've gone wrong and how we can do better in future. Because that was very something very much that I had in mind as I wrote it. Is there a, a historical event or time period that you haven't written about yet, but you would like to? Because you have covered so much history in your career, and I will happily consume all of it. But I'm curious if there's anything you haven't gotten to um, explore yet. Uh, yes, absolutely. But I feel like I need to keep those close to my chest for now because I don't want to uh, spoil if I don't end up writing about them, or I don't want to um, get people's hopes up if I don't end up writing about them for a few books yet. But yes, there are many that I would love to write about, and I will hopefully get to them all. <laughs> so every week on my podcast, I start off by talking about something I'm obsessed with. It could be a TV show, a movie, music, or even a book that I just read. Is there anything that you're currently obsessed with? Well, like everybody else, I am watching Bridgerton. So yes, I'm obsessed with Bridgerton. Uh, and I, it's just the fluffy, cotton candy, gorgeous, jeweled you know, dish of a thing that it is. And it's just a feast for the eyes. It's a lot of fun. And so I'm, I'm, I'm loving that. And I'm also thinking a lot about pirates, uh, just to go to the complete other end of the spectrum, because I recently rewatched a bit of Black Sails, which is the star show and pirates. And also at the same time, I just recently reread a fabulous rele new release by, uh, I think it's Bryony Cameron, which is called The Ballad of Jacques de la Haye. And that is about a black female pirate in the golden age of piracy in Hispaniola, who is trying to carve out a captaincy for her own little found family and which also and also win the heart of the woman she is very much in love with. So that was a particularly serendipitous bit of uh, reading for the viewing that I was having at the time. So it's it's either Regency Balls or it's Pirates with me right now. Honestly, same, because I also am watching Bridgerton. I have one episode left and my family had Pirates of the Caribbean on like in the background during our family dinner over the weekend. So I've also I've had Pirates on the brain because of that. And I will be looking out for that book because it sounds amazing. So is there anything that you're working on that you can tease for us? I think I can. Um, my next book is uh, probably coming out in 2026. Um, don't have a release date for it yet, but I have just finished the rough draft for it. It's with my critique partners. And all I can say is that it's a bit of a departure for me. It's different. It is a little bit less historical fiction, a little bit more magic realism. So that was, I think, maybe another reason I have a sentient house in this book, because I'm starting to play a little bit with some more fantastical elements. And um, the book coming after the Briar Club is uh, definitely going to have some more of those elements. And uh, the only thing I think I can tell you right now is it does have a title, and the title is The Astral Library. I'm already obsessed. <laughs> I cannot wait to read that. I mean, I know my listeners are also obsessed with you and they're probably freaking out as they hear this right now too. Thank you so much for joining me. I This is a five-star read for me and I don't give that out easily. I loved this book so much and just getting to hear you share your insights makes me love it even more. The Briar Club is out now, so everybody go pick that up. Kate, thank you so much for being here. No, thank you so much for having me. It's such a great discussion. I feel like we could have kept talking for another hour. <laughs> I know.